Greetings and welcome back. I'm going to start out today with a little bit different story. I'm going to give you my personal experience with cancer. It was January 2004 and I was in my office and I had just visited my OB-GYN in December. When I got the call, Roberta, you have breast cancer, I will tell you it took my breath away. First I started thinking, oh my goodness, I'm a mother, I'd love to be a grandmother, I'd love to see my children get married, and all the thoughts that all of us are going to have when we're uh, diagnosed with uh, a potentially life-threatening disease. When I got myself together, I went and told my boss, and I immediately left and got, uh, used all my connections and got in at MD Anderson. But somewhere in that process, I started thinking, well, why me? I exercise, I eat well, why me? And so after the why me was over and the pity party stopped, I thought I have the ability to tackle this with good nutrition, with exercise, and with my great medical team. And so I'm happy to say that I am a cancer survivor, but I will say for, for myself and maybe many of y'all, I will say this was a life-changing event. I will never look at a patient again the same way because once those words, you have cancer, hit me, I stopped in my tracks and I wasn't really able to hear the rest of the conversation. So it was a personal, terrifying journey, but one that I actually will say made me a better clinician in the long run. Well, currently, cancer is the second leading cause of death in the United States and the most feared diagnosis. Although heart disease is the number one killer of Americans, the diagnosis of cancer for me and many Americans is terrifying. In men, prostate cancer is the leading form of cancer, and for women, it's breast cancer. And certainly we have lots of public health campaigns to alert women to the dangers of breast cancer and the need for screening. However, we don't have the same vigilance when it comes to prostate cancer in men. Historically, prostate cancer is more common in men than breast cancer has been in women. However, of the cancers diagnosed in the year 2008, 25% of the new cancers in men were prostate, and 26% were breast cancers in women. So clearly, we have some work to do in the prevention of cancer. Well, poor diet is estimated to account for 30 to 35% of the cancers, and therefore, we can do something to modify our risk. But please keep in mind, just like me, modification of risk does not preclude the need for early detection and diagnosis. I was the one that found my breast cancer. It did not appear on a mammogram. I found it through regular breast exam. So again, please remember that although you might do everything possible in terms of diet and exercise, please make sure that you keep up with diagnostic testing. Additionally, outside of diet, there are other lifestyle risk factors such as tobacco use, alcohol consumption, and lack of exercise that can increase the overall risk of almost all cancers. Well, what's the focus of this lecture? This lecture is going to explore the dietary strategies and lifestyle modifications needed to reduce cancer risk. And we're also going to touch on how do we modify these recommendations if the diagnosis of cancer has been made. So do you do something differently? But to understand this, we have to understand the process of cancer development. And I think what this will do is reinforce to you the need that all of us need to have regular health exams and regular screening. Well, what is cancer? Simply stated, cancer is cells gone wild, cells that are misbehaving and not doing what they're supposed to do. All of us and all of our cells are constantly being exposed to DNA damaging events. So somewhere in our environment, we all have damage to our DNA. And what are these kinds of damaging events? Well, certainly sun exposure. If you're out in the sun, you can damage skin cells, you can damage the DNA in those cells, and again, increase your risk of cancer. Tobacco in all forms. And I had a, a young man in my class at Rice, and he was a baseball player and he would come to class chewing tobacco. And so one day after class, I said, I'd love to take you on a field trip. And so we took a field trip to MD Anderson and went to the oral cancer section. And he saw firsthand 
what happens when you chew tobacco, the damage that can be done to your oral cavity, a tongue resection. And I will tell you that was probably an aha moment for him that maybe, even though most baseball players may do this, this might not be what's best for him. Certainly environmental chemicals. For me, I worked in a nutrition lab in graduate school and I was exposed to a lot of environmental chemicals. Alcohol can be this um, DNA damaging event. When we cluster all of these together, these events are known as initiation. This is the entrance into cancer. And again, all of us can't look into our, our historical crystal ball and say, what was my initiating event? But chances are we've all had one. Well, under genetic control and complex cell machinery, the damaged cells can either have two specific fates. It can go in two different directions. It can go to cell death, the cell line can die off, and this is known as apoptosis. The normal cell mechanisms can't repair the cell and it dies. Okay? It can also progress, and this damaged cell can progress and the cell can multiply. And this is where we have a little bit of a concern. Because again, we can't look into our cell machinery and say, which fate did my damaged cell have? So it can either go to apoptosis or it can progress and the cell can multiply. The development of a blood supply to this aberrant cell growth is what we call as cancer. So again, we've all had this in these initiating events. Hopefully, our cell machinery is great and that cell line dies off. But if the cell line goes wild, and develops its own blood supply that's known as cancer. Tumors appear to be made of many different types of cells, including precancerous stem cells, and this was first discovered in leukemia. These stem cells have the characteristics of both abnormal and normal cells. And some science suggests that these stem cells that are kind of hiding and lurking in the background with characteristics of both abnormal and normal cells are one of the reasons why cancer can return. Okay. Let's get to the nuts and bolts. What about cancer prevention? Well, just like my rice baseball player, elimination of tobacco in all forms. No form of tobacco is safe. Keep in mind, tobacco can be an initiating event. This is particularly deadly when you combine it with alcohol. Both tobacco and alcohol are thought to initiate and promote cancer development. So you get a, a deadly two for the price of one here. Not only do they cause cell damage, they also actually promote cancer development. Additionally, the American Cancer Society suggests that one million skin cancers could be prevented by eliminating sun exposure. Now in our lecture on vitamin D, again, this is a double-edged sword because we know that the sun is a great source of vitamin D. And so by eliminating sun exposure, you can also eliminate your, your, uh, one of your major sources of vitamin D. Sunscreen can be very effective for preventing skin cancer, but it must be applied in an appropriate way. With the higher the SPF rating in general, the better. Exposure to UV light in tanning salons can be just as dangerous as exposure to the sun itself. So for those of you who want that overall glow, maybe you use a topical uh, suntan, fake suntan, and get it that way rather than uh, risking going to a tanning salon. Certainly some of the more exciting things in terms of cancer development is now we know that certain viruses have been implicated in cervical cancer and, and possibly some other cancers as well. The new Gardasil vaccine can be given to prevent certain forms, but not all forms, of cervical cancer caused by the HPV virus. Well, what about food and healthy lifestyles? The current thinking is that food and nutrition can either act as a cancer cell promoter, so again, it can force that cell line into the development of cancer, or a cancer cell killer, it can promote apoptosis. According to the American Cancer Society, diet and weight management can aid in the prevention of cancer. So think about it this way. If you're struggling with weight management and you're struggling with exercise, you might want to think about this as your deposit in the cancer, cancer prevention bank. You really want to look at that in a positive way and maybe uh, it might change the way that you look at some of your, your favorite, although not healthier foods. Exercise most days of the week, and in this case, there appears to be a dose-related response. 
And what does that mean? It means 30 minutes is good, but an hour would be better. Human bodies are designed to move. And apparently, in this case, what is happening is that uh, in individuals who do not exercise, they become resistant to insulin, so they make more insulin. And remember our lecture on prediabetes and metabolic syndrome. The more insulin you make, insulin is an anabolic hormone. Anabolic means building, and what you're doing is promoting cancer uh, development when you don't exercise. You are increasing insulin resistance, your body makes more insulin, Insulin is an anabolic hormone, promotes cancer development. So exercise, again, is part of that ticket to good health. Well, let's make some simple recommendations because simple recommendations matter. How about thinking of a plant-based diet? And again, over and over this comes up in normal nutrition and disease prevention. Plant-based diet means the more of your plate that is occupied by vegetables, the better. One way that you might want to think about this is think about having a meatless Monday where your main dish on Monday night might be vegetarian. Now, by vegetarian, I'm talking about beans and um, tofu and, and not necessarily just cheese or other high-fat foods. This term, meatless Monday, was first coined by a group of nutrition professionals at Johns Hopkins, and I use this a lot in my clinical practice. Can I get you to eat vegetarian one night per week? Additionally, what I'm doing is helping people to choose different foods that maybe they haven't tried before. So maybe it's a veggie burger that you have. That might be a way of, of looking at it along with a big uh, plate of three bean salad to go along with it. A recent study in the Archives of Internal Medicine, which included more than a half a million subjects, so this should make you pause a second because keep in mind this is a large, large number of people, suggests that those who have or consume the highest amount of red meat have a higher mortality rate. And this study is known as the NIH AARP Diet and Health Study. Mortality rates from both heart disease and cancer were increased with increasing red meat consumption. So what are some big recommendations from this study? We'll reduce the meat and avoid grilling. Grilling and particularly marinating can increase the charring of that, that grilled meat. But it appears that beer and wine-based marinades might actually reduce the risk, and the science is still emerging on this. It is the charred meat that can increase the risk of cancer. The increase in high temperatures with high-protein foods increases the production of what are known as heterocyclic amines. They are the charred byproducts of grilling. Now say, for example, you're invited over to somebody's house, they're not really great with their grilling skills, and you've got everything that is significantly blackened. Trim off as much of that as you can. Trim off the blackened piece and maybe flavor it up with a little bit more barbecue sauce, but trim off the burn portion and reduce the production or the consumption of heterocyclic amines. Once again, eating more whole grains matters in terms of cancer prevention. And what's the etiology or what's the mechanism behind this? Well, this could easily be that whole grains are going to have more fiber, Whole grains are, are possibly going to be, again, this wonderful compound called a prebiotic, food for the probiotics, and that might be it. Or maybe it's an individual nutrient within the whole grains. Maybe it's magnesium here raising its head in whole grains. So again, eating more whole grains is going to make a difference as well. So these are part of our simple recommendations. Now regarding alcohol use in cancer prevention, the best approach is no alcohol. Because keep in mind, alcohol, um, at least minimally, is going to serve as an initiating event. But if you do drink alcohol, the recommendation is to limit your intake to one drink per day for women and two for men. Certainly, avoid cured meats. These are processed meats such as bacon, ham, and hot dogs. And I'm going to caution you here. As individuals try and get away from beef and pork, we now have cured turkey products. We have turkey hot dogs, and everyone believes, again, because of that singular first ingredient, oh, turkey has to be better for me. Well, the problem is it's the curing of the meat that is going to increase cancer risk as well. Nitrosamines are cancer-causing uh, compounds that are formed when meats are cured, and these should be limited in everyone's diet. Certainly think of things that you might um, have at a picnic. Are we always going to have hot dogs and cured meats, or can we come up with some other strategies? 
But isn't there more? Well, yes, there is more. And this is probably the good news to the story. There are magical compounds, and I really do call them magical compounds in fruits and vegetables. The colors of the rainbow represent the pot of gold at the end of the fruit and vegetable and plant-based diet. So I want you to think when you're organizing your plant-based meals, color and variety of colors matters. So let's explore some of those. First and foremost, we're gonna take a look at a compound called indols. And indols are the whites and the greens. These are also known as cruciferous vegetables. So things like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, and kale. Those are all, again, the whites and the greens. I will tell you, when I was, uh, first started my career in nutrition, we would say, well, cauliflower is good for you, but because it doesn't have an, enough vitamin C or fill in the vitamin, we really don't think you need to consume much cauliflower. It's not the vitamins in the fruits and the vegetables that are cancer preventers. And most of the vitamin studies have fallen short. It's the colors, it's the pigments, it's the words we can't pronounce that oftentimes are gonna be the nutritional heroes in fruits and vegetables. What do these compounds do? What do indols do? They down-regulate, they reduce the production of one of the stages of cell division in the cancer process. We also know that indols can act as negative estrogen regulators and alter the effects of estrogen and promote cell, cancer cell apoptosis. So let's think about this one for a second. Most of the breast cancer in women is estrogen receptor positive. So what that means is that you are vulnerable, as a, a woman, increased risk of breast cancer, you are vulnerable to the increased uh, amounts of estrogen. So what that means is if indols can actually downregulate that estrogen receptor, it may reduce your risk of the most common form of breast cancer. Research also suggests that they can be invaluable in the prevention of cervical cancer, particularly in those who have what is called precancerous cervical dysplasia, that they're already in that um, suspicious range and the indols may be preventative. Certainly there's a potential role in the prevention of prostate cancer. So again, if we pause and think breast cancer is most common in women, prostate in men, think about are there creative ways that you can put more broccoli and cabbage. Coleslaw would be a great example, great example of where you could introduce some cabbage into someone's diet that may not like it. Continuing on the colors of the rainbow, lycopene. And lycopene is the red pigment. And I want you to think if the food is red, it rules. So things like tomatoes, pink grapefruit, watermelon, all of those are great red foods. Well, I've been asked if juices of these fruits and vegetables are beneficial. And certainly the whole food is preferred, but in a pinch, juices can serve as a reasonable substitute. So let's say you're traveling and you don't have the availability of a fresh salad, but you decide you're gonna grab a can of tomato juice. That'd be a really great plan, really great. It's not quite as good, but it's almost as good as the whole uh, fruit or vegetable. Multiple roles exist for lycopene in the prevention of cancer. It acts as an antioxidant, protecting those wonderful cell membranes. It may prevent the abnormal cell division. Large epidemiological studies show a relationship between those who have low levels of lycopene in their blood and an increased prevalence of prostate cancer. So there appears to be a relationship. However, currently, studies have not demonstrated the prevention of prostate cancer through increased consumption of lycopene. But again, the science is emerging on this topic, so stay tuned. Cooked tomato products actually have an increased amount of bioavailable lycopene. So here's an example where raw is not going to be as good as cooked. So when you're having your meatless Monday and you're trying a veggie burger, put ketchup on it. So how many times have you heard a dietitian say, use a condiment to prevent cancer? Probably not too many times. Spice up your food with some additional colors. So as we think about the colors of the rainbow, think gold. Turmeric, which is a traditional curry spice, is actually a cancer prevention powerhouse. The active compound is curcumin, and curcumin is, um, again, thought to induce cell apoptosis, have that aberrant cell die rather than proliferate. It is best studied in colon cancer and leukemia. So again, maybe on your meatless Monday, you might wanna try a chickpea curry and add some turmeric to it, again, to have a double uh, cancer-preventing diet. 
However, as we discover with many dietary compounds, there can be some downsides to using turmeric. And here's an example. Turmeric, particularly when it's used as a supplement and not as a spice, may reduce the effectiveness of chemotherapy. So here's the pause. Sometimes compounds that are needed for the prevention of cancer actually are not a good idea during cancer treatment. And this is where you need to talk to your physician, uh, visit a registered dietitian, uh, because again, sometimes good for prevention may not be so good during treatment. Well, what about yellow and orange uh, produce, such as carrots and corn and cantaloupe? In a recent study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, carotenoids were found to decrease the risk of breast cancer in postmenopausal women. And remember, it's the carotenoids that are the yellow-orange pigments. So the carotenoids may reduce the risk of breast cancer in postmenopausal women. Well, what about the other colors of the rainbow? How about some blues and purples and some additional reds? Pretty simply stated, think berries. Berries such as blueberries. And again, I started out in graduate school and we were actually told don't waste your calories on blueberries because there really is no nutrition in blueberries. And now they have ramped up on the scale, again, not because of their vitamin content, but because of a compound called anthocyanidins. Anthocyanidins in blueberries and raspberries and strawberries actually contain wonderful phytochemicals that can repair the DNA damage. So again, you've had this initiating event, you're trying to salvage that cell, and to the rescue come the berries. Remember that the damage to DNA cells is the first step of cancer development. So these berries have the potential to stop cancer in its tracks. Now what about green tea? Anybody up for green tea? Tea outside of water is the most popular beverage in the world. It is brewed from the leaves of the Camellia sensesis plant. Tea is rich in polyphenolic compounds, most notably catechins and EGCG. You might see EGCG added to diet products because there's also a thought that this rich polyphenolic compound, EGCG, may actually stimulate your metabolic rate. Although that might be true, it's a slight increase in your metabolic rate and doesn't give you license to go out and eat that 900 calorie slice of cheesecake. These compounds in tea can prevent the development of dangerous cell lines by again inducing apoptosis. Now the double-edged sword here is soy. It contains a group of compounds known as isoflavones and these compounds may have estrogen-like effects. But here's again what the American consumer has done. Since in most of our dietary backgrounds, we did not grow up eating soy, uh, tofu, miso, tempeh. We don't necessarily have a taste for soy. So what we've done is take a wonderful food like whole soy and try to dissect out what are the active ingredients. And now what we have in a lot of energy bars and nutrition bars are a group of compounds called soy isoflavones. So the real dilemma is whole soy may be protective against the development of breast cancer, but now we have a little bit of concern for those who may actually have breast cancer. The compounds uh, that are thought to be active in soy are, are called genistein, daidzine, and glycetine. Again, all these words that we cannot pronounce. Genistein has been shown to slow cell cancer growth in, in again, this aberrant cell line. I think the challenge, however, is that you have to look at this and think, okay, where did it show cell growth or the slowing of cell growth? And it's generally in the, in the test tube. So again, one of the concerns is, is it the whole soy that we should be looking at? Because again, many breast cancers are estrogen positive and estrogen positive breast cancer, you probably shouldn't be using these soy isoflavones. Certainly, however, we may want to reduce the risk of prostate cancer. So think about this for a second. If a good percentage of breast cancer is estrogen positive, that means many prostate cancers are testosterone fueled. So soy in the prevention of prostate cancer may work from a different mechanism. And how does that work? Again, it's going to compete with testosterone. Genistein, again, one of these wonderful um, active ingredients in soy, may actually interfere with one of the most popular breast cancer drugs, tamoxifen. So again, where whole soy may help prevent breast cancer, 
a soy protein isolate or an isoflavone may actually interfere with tamoxifen treatment. Now, what role do vitamins play? Like other food-based compounds, vitamins may play a role in the prevention of cancer. Folic acid is one. Folic acid is a B vitamin, and it is needed for DNA synthesis. A major study in China has linked low levels of folic acid with breast cancer, meaning if you have a low level of folic acid in your blood, it increases the risk of breast cancer. Folic acid may also help in the prevention of pancreatic and colon cancer. Now again, a lot of this is depending on when were you exposed to low levels of folic acid, and that's going to be an important consideration. However, a popular chemotherapeutic agent, a drug to treat cancer, and a standard treatment for rheumatoid arthritis, methotrexate, works as a folic acid antagonist. Now, I want you to think about this. Why would you give a vitamin antagonist for the treatment of cancer? Well, if cancer needs folic acid to divide and replicate, if I remove folic acid from the milieu, if I remove the folic acid, i.e. methotrexate, if I remove the folic acid, I can, I can actually promote cell death. The problem is your healthy cells also need folic acid, and this is one of the reasons why individuals oftentimes lose hair or have mouth ulcers as part of cancer treatment, is the cells are deprived, the normal healthy cells are deprived of folic acid in an attempt to remove it from a cancer cell and stop its growth. Now, think about this for a second. If you decide you're, uh, you're using methotrexate for, let's say, rheumatoid arthritis, the addition of folic acid to the diet of someone using methotrexate may actually reduce the effectiveness of the drug. Okay, do we have other vitamin heroes in the prevention of cancer? Vitamin D. Vitamin D from sunlight or from supplements may be effective in the prevention of, of breast cancer. This is supported by the fact that many women with breast cancer, active breast cancer, were shown to be deficient in this vitamin. Keep in mind, reflect back to the vitamin lecture. One of the things that vitamin D does is it teaches cells what they should become. It helps the cell to have normal differentiation. It is the conductor of the orchestra. So it sends the cell in the direction it should be. In the absence of vitamin D, the thought is, hmm, what's gonna happen here? If I don't have adequate amounts of vitamin D, the cell may not have its normal differentiation process, and it may go on to form an aberrant cell line. Okay? However, as with folic acid, sometimes the results of studies are less than convincing. Data from the Women's Health Initiative showed no effects in terms of cancer prevention. Also, in men with aggressive prostate cancer, the higher blood levels of vitamin D is associated with an increased mortality. Recall from a previous lecture on, on vitamin E and its effectiveness in cancer prevention. The American Cancer Society study suggested that those who take vitamin E for 10 years may reduce the risk of bladder cancer. But again, on the other hand, and this is the way clinical nutrition always is, the SELECT study demonstrated that taking vitamin E and selenium together was not an effective strategy for the prevention of prostate cancer. So do we have any take-home points? How do we sort the nuts from the berries? First and foremost, control your weight, your life, and your food. Easy for me to say, not so easy to do. Choose plant-based foods and, and beverages. Think fruits and vegetables first, and think about how easy this would be. You go to a, a buffet, and everyone tells me, oh, the buffet is the worst. I will tell you a buffet is, should be the easiest place because what you do is you think, okay, I'm on my cancer prevention diet, I'm gonna have at least 50% of my plate is gonna be fruits and vegetables, and then I'll fill it, I call it backfilling, I'll backfill the rest of my plate with some of my favorite foods, but I wanna make sure that I front load my plate with lots of fruits and vegetables. Choose from the colors of the rainbow. As we've learned, multi multiple um, wonderful phytochemicals in fruits and vegetables, vitamins and minerals in fruits and vegetables that may be linked with the prevention of cancer. Okay, frequently asked questions. What about nutritional needs during and after chemotherapy and radiation treatments for cancer? There are changes in nutritional needs depending on the type of cancer and more importantly, the type of treatment. 
So for me personally, I did not do chemotherapy. I caught my cancer early. It was not a very aggressive form. And so I just did six weeks of radiation. In radiation, you're having significant cell damage, so making sure that you have a diet rich in fruits and vegetables to promote the healing of that damaged tissue is really pretty important. Plus, increasing water is important to get rid of the waste products from, from radiation. But when you're trying to customize, because not all cancers, cancer is not a homogeneous term. It is very heterogeneous. There's more than one type of breast cancer, more than one type of prostate cancer. So always consult your, your physician or a dietitian for a more customized dietary program. Beverages. I, I'm asked questions all the time, well, I love coffee. Can you give me some justification? Does coffee have any cancer-fighting properties? Well, studies have shown that coffee consumption up to two cups a day may actually reduce the risk of liver cancer. Keep in mind, because coffee is plant-based, it's going to have phytochemicals, it's going to have wonderful polyphenolic compounds that may actually help in cancer prevention. However, another study revealed that coffee may be associated with an increased risk of lung cancer. Keep in mind, some of the compounds in coffee are antioxidants, and we learned with beta-carotene, another antioxidant, that that also increases the risk of lung cancer. How would I get vitamin D? Another popular question. I'm avoiding the sunlight. I'm following the American Cancer Society's recommendation to avoid exposure to the sun. Can I use a supplement? And the answer is absolutely yes. Use a supplement, particularly if you're not in the sun and you don't drink milk or you don't have any sources of fortified vitamin D in your diet. Take a supplement. Keep in mind that nutrition has to be consistent for it to work. So you're gonna to have to have cues to remind yourself, how am I gonna to remember to take my vitamin D? Maybe you leave it on your kitchen counter. Maybe you put it by your toothbrush. I've actually had patients who have taken their vitamin D bottle and taped it to the deodorant. Not gonna leave the house without using deodorant. So this might be a way to remember. You have to do it on a regular basis for it to work. So thank you very much and uh, go out and prevent cancer.